Atlanta has one of the fastest growing populations in America and is one of the least dense major metro areas in the country. Now, local leaders are trying to transform this sprawling, car-dependent region into a web of walkable urban communities connected by a variety of low-carbon transportation options. This is Futurizing Atlanta. Home to the government of Georgia, the Centers for Disease Control, top universities, and numerous Fortune 100 companies, Atlanta is the largest state capital by population in the nation. And last year, jumped ahead of Miami, Philly, and DC to become the sixth largest metro area. It is the dynamic hub of the South and has the busiest airport in the world. But its public transportation system has been left behind after decades of underfunding and sabotage. When white residents left the city for the suburbs, they elected leaders who perpetuated segregationist policies, like stopping any mass transit projects that would have linked black and white communities. This racism is what Atlanta's most storied man, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and his fellow civil rights activists struggled against. It's a disturbing history that carries cultural baggage. Here in the South, wealth or money is associated with what you own. Riding MARTA um, essentially means that you are unable to afford a car. Today, a new generation of Atlantans is choosing to walk and ride together over driving separately. They've spent decades designing and building the Beltline, currently one of the largest scale urban renewal projects in the United States. The nearly complete 22-mile network of multi-use trails and parks along a former rail corridor that loops around downtown has made neighborhoods accessible that have never been connected before by foot. This is huge. We on the west side really felt as if this would not take place in our community. APS schools, Atlanta University Center, you can get everything you need right here on the west side. We got plenty of houses for sale, come on home. <laughs> What the Beltline is doing for the disabled community is incredible. The Beltline is like my highway. And then I've been able to ride miles and connect to different parts of the city and all while riding a bike and it's changed my life. In a rare big city without a major body of water, the reviews for the park-like promenade are in. It's a hit and is revitalizing entire areas while attracting just the kind of new, high quality, dense development planners had in mind. The second phase of the Beltline was planned years earlier, an extension of the city's fixed track streetcar. Funding is in place to begin laying it along the East Side Trail, but before giving it the final green light, the mayor of Atlanta is wisely considering other options. So we have to think, is it gonna be rail? Is it gonna be autonomous vehicles like pods? People have this notion that we're talking about putting heavy rail around the Beltline. That's not the case. You're talking about a nice, slow moving people movement. He's taken some flack for proposing driverless pods, but it's an alternative that might provide more value and flexibility. For example, a company called Faction uses small, lightweight vehicles. We essentially went and took light electric systems, put on a light uh, autonomy system, and we combine this with teleoperation. This allows us to have a vehicle that's highly automated, but a human can help it on occasion when the vehicle encounters something it needs some assistance with. So our vehicles tend to operate like a virtual train system. So what they do is they follow known missions. We're about 90% less cost of the hardware on the vehicle systems. More importantly, we're about 95% less power consumption. Mobility companies seem to finally be arriving at right-sized solutions. By only having a few operators, you're then able to handle large fleets of these vehicles. You know, our teleoperational workstation, it's $2,000 including the desk and the chair. The next phase must also take into account how popular and crowded it has become. The bike was trying to avoid us and it hit a stack of other bikes that were actually parked. A lot of people getting close to being hit. There's like no bike zones or the no scooter zones. Maybe just making the Beltline one of those. Yeah, I think there should be a different park for those type of motorized bikes because folks are coming here with their kids, their family, their pets. All wheeled travel could be on a separate path where the streetcar would have run safely away from pedestrians. Meanwhile, proponents of the streetcar say it's what the Beltline was meant to be all along, is what's needed to support high density development and will ensure equality for those with mobility challenges. But however it optimizes the Beltline, 
it should continue encouraging e-bikes. The city recently launched a pilot program that helped 500 lower income residents buy one. For some folks who come to this program, this e-bike is gonna be the difference between getting to work on time. For some other folks, it's gonna be the difference of getting a job, period. Earlier this year, these efforts got a speed boost when Atlanta was awarded a $207 million Reconnecting Communities and Neighborhoods grant from the Biden-Harris administration's infrastructure bill to help build phase one of the stitch, a cap over I-85 covered in 14 acres of parks and public spaces that will fuse downtown with Midtown. And also connect east and west segments of the Beltline to downtown. So it's about getting people to this area as much as it is making this place a nice place to be. The stitch will also feature the Civic Center station of MARTA, the city's two-line metro network. It crosses the Beltline four times, like points on a compass. Each of these nodes will soon have a station. Atlantans are also finally getting bus rapid transit. The first line will connect the Beltline to the redevelopment happening downtown around Mercedes-Benz Stadium an area that's currently so unwelcoming, locals call it the Gulch. We have a 50-acre hole in the middle of our downtown that makes it not walkable, disconnects communities. This is gonna fill the hole in the heart of the city. With interest rates continuing to come down, developers are gearing up in Atlanta and in cities throughout the country to build the sustainable, walkable urbanism that is now the lifestyle of choice for a majority of Americans. The market wants it. There's pent up demand for it, and it's gonna take at least a generation to satisfy that, that pent-up demand. Metro Atlanta is forecasted to add nearly 2 million more residents in the next 25 years. Sadly, many of them will arrive after having been displaced following extreme weather events. The same type of climate refugee Hurricane Helene just created thousands of along the Florida Gulf Coast and river-swept North Carolina mountains. Atlanta has environmental challenges of its own with flooding and a dwindling supply of drinking water both impacting future development. Leaders are betting they can solve these challenges with conservation and new technologies and infrastructure. Inside of the newly built Westside Park, the city's largest green space, they just converted an old quarry into a massive reservoir. At 350 feet deep, the lake now holds 2.4 billion gallons, an emergency water supply that would last the city an entire month. In the years ahead, Atlanta, which is the most successful urban forest in the United States, with 50% of its land shaded by trees, should begin to feel like one giant interconnected urban park.